Today on This Old House, I take the apprentices to sill school. We are going to make the ceiling height higher by making the basement floor lower. In this town, if you go too far with the renovation, the building department insists on a full inspection of the existing sewer line. What happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice. See this main roof form? We're just going to pull that forward to it's even where this existing deck is. Definitely says mid-century modern. The money's in the detail. That is beautiful. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to this old house here in Brookline, Massachusetts where we are working on this 1950s modern home for a young family who lives here in town. They've asked us to make several upgrades to this house and some of the first things we did started outside. There was a whole line of invasive trees that were damaging this beautiful stone wall so they had to come out. And over here you can see that the excavation and form work for a new garage and addition above has already started. And inside the house we've done a number of things. We started off with abating the asbestos and Mark McCullough, our mason, with the help of our two apprentices, Eric and Carly, actually took down a chimney that went through the roof down two stories into the basement. And that is now completely gone. The top half of this addition is going to be living space that will connect to the first floor of the main house. But right here, we're going to have a one-car garage, and we need a person door to get into the original house. So, Mark, that means going through the foundation wall. You can see the, I don't know, what is that, 12 inches or so of concrete? 12 or a little bit more, yep. Cut that away. But you've also got to do something with the floor? So, we do have a height problem. So, this floor has to come out. And once it comes out, we're going to dig down another seven or eight inches. So you're taking out a total of almost a foot Almost here? a foot, yeah. And that's not to get it even with the garage here. You actually want to pick up some head height. I mean, Richard and I were in here, you know, a few weeks ago. And we had to kind of duck. What do, we, right. what do we have right now? So you're a little under six and a half feet right now. To here. Which, again, is not enough to really function in the room, so. Yep, and then we've got this, which takes us even lower. I mean, this, you... yeah, right, no good, right. So this beam comes out. We're going to tuck it under the floor itself. So that gets get us rid six of it. or eight inches. That gives you a little more, but we're going to gain all the height when we take the floor down and out. So Okay, and so what's the process? Well, I mean, I guess that's the process right there. <laughs> you got the jackhammer That's it, up. that's it. We got a lot of sleep last night, so <laughs> first thing to do. But we're just going to start banging away. We're going to have a bucket at the doorway. Bucket's going to take the material to a truck. Truck's going to take it out of here, and hopefully soon enough we'll be down. Each year, hundreds of thousands of soldiers transition from military to civilian life. But that's not always easy. The skills that you learn in the service may not translate to the ones you need in the work world. Well, as part of our Generation Next initiative, we found a program here at Fort Stewart in Georgia that is turning troops into workers who will be on the front lines of the building trades. John Corson is the president of the Home Builders Institute. John, nice to meet you. Kevin, nice to meet you. I'm Thank glad you. we caught you on a morning when a class is in session. Um, I'm fascinated by the organization. Give me a little sense of its history and your guys' mission. Sure. HBI, we're a 50-year-old uh, nonprofit that, in a short word, we, tra we train underserved and at-risk populations in the building trades. Right. One of our newest initiatives over the last two or three years is training separating military personnel. Mm -hmm. We get them certified and we place them in jobs in the industry. These guys are just ready to learn. It's like a sponge. They just want to soak it in. So you couldn't ask for a better student um, population. Yeah. Um, they, want, they want to know more and more and more. Building and learning how things work has always been like a passion of mine, mm -hmm. something I've really been interested in. And I decided, well, I'm getting out. Might as well take this time to pursue this opportunity. Even for those that never had a background in construction, they come through this program and, and they see what's out there. We take them to different job sites, let them see the commercial aspect, the, the residential aspect, take them to different unions, different employers come in and, and try to hire and such forth. What we do here is we drop rank at the door. They all wear the same t-shirt and um, we drop rank but we don't lose respect. 
And so they can start that transition process and go through the 12 weeks in here that they don't have to say yes, sir, or do anything by order. Carpentry uh, training right here. This is. Carpentry is sort of the foundation for all of our training. So this is the, the youngest group we have in here and to teach them the basic of the carpentry trade. Since I've been in class, we've covered plumbing, we've covered electrical, we cover HVAC, um, facility maintenance. So pretty much we've touched everything you could think of involved in construction. I'm still convinced that I'm gonna be a carpenter, but I still have those skills in my back pocket if I need them. So what's your success rate? I mean, how many of these people are gonna be placed and working when they get out of this program? Our placement rate right now is over 90% wow. in this area. Leaving from a very structured environment to you make your life what you want it, it was a little intimidating at first. Yeah. Does this program help with that transition? Yes, the Soldier for Life program definitely uh, helped me with that transition. It gave me more confidence, and it helped me translate the skills that I had in the Army into, you know, civilian equivalents. We have people working in electrical, building maintenance, um, hotel maintenance. Um, we have um, carpenters. We have uh, people working as electricians, summer apprentices. So what is it like to have served have been a student and now to be an instructor. It this. feels great, honestly, it does. Um, for me, because I was an NCO leaving the Army, I still look at upon taking care of, of my brothers and sisters that are leaving the military. So that's why I'm still here, pretty much. Mark McCullough and his crew did a great job doing the full demo down here, and it was a lot of work. And they've temporarily held the building up with these temp walls. But before we go any farther, we really have to assess just what's reusable of the mechanical systems in this building. And in this town, if you go too far with the renovation, the building department insists on a full inspection of the existing sewer line. That's a video inspection. Here's the sewer line right here going outside. Charlie Brennick's helping us this year with our inspection here. So you got a fancy new gizmo here. Uh, yes, this is my camera monitor. This does the recording of our high definition video. And this is the camera itself. Right. So we've seen uh, that before, but it's high def now, right? Right. Uh, it's got a self leveling head, so we're always nice. straight up. And it also has a special sonde in here. And that allows me, if we find something wrong in this pipe, I can actually go out and locate it. That'll tell us where it is and exactly how deep right. it is cool. to make the excavation as easy as Good. possible. Let's take the dive. All right. So, little stuff there. So, Keep we've going. got some dirt in here. Boy, there's a lot of dirt and rocks in there. Isn't Keep this going. is more than we'd expect to see. There's a ton of debris in here. Look at it all. What do you do with that? Do you actually drive the rocks down into the main sewer? That's not good. Uh, no, what we can do is use a machine called a high-pressure water jet, and we can rake all those rocks right out of the pipe. So go down beyond it and then blow it all back this way? Exactly. Well, this would be the time to do it, wouldn't it? All right, let's see beyond that. So try to get beyond the rocks if you can. Whew. Okay, so more rocks. Oh, we've got something else here. There's it a... looks like, is that roots? Yeah, this is tree roots growing into the pipe. So in order to have tree roots, you have to have a break in the pipe and then the roots get in through the joint. Yeah, they're able to grow in between the old connections of the clay right. pipe. And, and it's perfect together. feeding ground for a root. They, they love the, what's inside that pipe. Yeah, you've got water all the time and nutrients all the time. All right. Okay. You can see them all around the edges. That's all okay. embedded tree roots. Now we down. I don't know. This and looks now much we're in better. a beautiful pipe. So beyond the tree roots, the, it's in great shape, it looks like. Yeah, this is what we like to see. Okay. There's the drop into the sewer, it looks yep, like. Yep, this is our city sewer. All right, so that thing is so telling. That's great. So right. we've proven that the majority of this line is in good shape, and we'll give this to the town to review. But we found rocks early. We found a break at, what, 10, 12 feet. We right. found tree roots. 
you know, and you think about the condition here. You can either blow it back, but when I look at this water main, this is copper, and this looks to be galvanized steel pipe, which is a metal pipe that rust that needs to be replaced. It probably makes as much sense for us to dig the front yard to that 12 feet and get rid of at least that break right here and have a new water main mm. and a new thing. So this is really helpful. Good job, Charlie. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, guys, now that the foundation is completed and it's backfilled, we're ready to move to the next step. Now, when they put the foundation in, the surveyors pinned the corners, and when the form guys came, they put the forms in place, made sure that they were perfectly plumb, they shot grades for the top of the foundation. So now we know that it's, the foundation is located in the exact right place. The next step is we start building with wood. And the first thing we do with wood on a house is we provide for the sills. And that's an important part because it has to be straight and it has to be level because now we're going to build on top of that. Here it will be walls and other places it might be flooring. And if you don't have that perfectly level and straight, you're going to have trouble all the way up. Now one of the first things I like to do is deal with the top of the foundation. They did a great job, but every once in a while you'll see a little nub that's sticking up high and that's going to affect the sill. So just take your hammer and you know, just kind of knock off some of those little nubs all the way down the edge of the foundation and if you see anything in the middle. All right, now before we get started, I want to show you some of the pieces that we're going to be dealing with. We're going to start with this little foam. It's like a moisture barrier, and that's going to go on top of the foundation, just like that. The first layer of the sill will be a two by six, pressure treated lumber, and that goes on top of that foam. And the last piece will be this regular lumber, which goes on top of that. So that gives us a three inch lift of material. So why do you only use pressure treated on the first layer? Well, you always use pressure treat at any time you're next to any kind of masonry. Otherwise, it'll start to absorb the moisture and then it'll rot. And that's why we use it there. The second piece, it doesn't really matter. It can be regular dimensional lumber. It's far enough away from the masonry. So now the next thing we want to work on will be these bolts. Now, when the foundation was poured, the bolts were put in by the foundation contractor and the concrete was wet. So it's not unusual that they might not be perfectly vertical. Just take a nut. You don't want to damage the threads by hitting with your hammer. And then use your hammer to start straightening it out. You just have to look each way. Make this one go this way. And this one's got to go this way. So do that to every bolt that you see that's out of place. So now we have to locate the sill, so we're going to snap some lines. The sill is about five and a half inches. We don't want it to come inside of this foundation. So I'm going to go out to five, I'm going to go to five and a quarter, put another one over here, and we'll mark that end and that end, and then we'll snap some lines. Now what I like to do on a long snap for the line is push down in the middle instead of snapping the whole thing and then do each side, and then this one. All right, that's the layout. All right, we'll line up the outside edge with our chalk line. Now we can locate the bolts. So just take a square, and you can mark each side of the bolt. So it's pretty much the easiest way, like that. Like that. With the sill still on the chalk line, I now can measure from the edge of the sill to the center of the bolt. You can see it's about two and a sixteenth. I bring that over here and mark the center of the bolt where we're going to drill it. Okay, you can start to drill right there. All right, one thing I want to tell you about using the bit, we want that hole to be straight, so put the drill back in there. And see how you can see the edge of how deep you're going? Yeah. If you start seeing it go deeper on one edge, that means you're getting out of square to the wood. So just kind of so keep that sure. yep, both yeah. ways. Yeah. You, you look at that hole. If it's even, you're doing great. Okay. 
Now we're going to put a piece on top of this. All you have to do now is use these holes as a guide to drill the holes for that piece. All right. All right, number one. Okay. All right. Now, as you can see, this is not a 90 degree corner, so we have to cut these pieces at an angle. An easy way to cut this top one is to slide another piece of stock just temporarily along the chalk line, and then put on top of that another piece of stock, line it up so it's even on the outside, like that. And I can just take a square, line it up with that edge, and draw a line to make the cut. All right, let's take these off, set them on the ground, and roll out the sill sealer. Okay, now we want to take a washer and a nut. All right, now with the sill secured, we're gonna check for level. Right on there. And right on there, we got lucky today. <laughs> the foundation dies did a great job. However, if there were some dips or bumps in the foundation, we would shim these to be level and we would shim them between the pressure treated piece and this piece, because we don't want to disrupt the sill sealer. And if you put enough shims in here, you have perfect support. So, nice job, Thanks. but we're not done yet. <laughs> we still have several weeks of rough construction back at the house, but this is the time when decisions about the interior finishes need to be made. So today we have come to a Boston Design Center where our homeowner, Sunil, is meeting with the design team. Hey, Marriott. Hey, it's Sunil. How are you guys? Hi, Kevin. Good to Hi, see Kevin. You. How are you? Good to see you. How Very are you well. doing? Very well, thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Love to see you guys hard at work, already into the design and layout. Yep. Thank you. Um, which I want to dive into. I, I know there's a little bit of controversy in terms of where to put the stove, right? Yep. Uh, we've always wanted it against the window, right against that countertop you see. Which is not typically where we would place the stove for a variety of reasons, right? Correct. First of all, you have code. Um, you also have, you need a splash of sur surface behind the cooking um, and also how we're going to venting and we have a little bit of special here because we are actually using a gas cooktop mm -hmm. plus a surface on induction so we actually have even a more wider surface to be able to vent. So I'm seeing a rendering of it in the island. Um, this is obviously to persuade you. Yes. Not persuasive enough? You don't like that? Well, I, functionally I think but aesthetically I just don't, <laughs> you know, that's always the battle, right? Uh, but I, I just don't think I like the look. We wanted a clean island with, mm. with nothing on it and uh, that big hood han hanging in the middle of the kitchen just doesn't look right to me. I think if it went against the window or against the wall, it'll just have a better appeal. Can we see a rendering of it in front of the window? Absolutely. As you can see here, we have the gas cooktop with the induction and the hood will be suspended from the ceiling. And so seeing it here in this rendering, are you okay? Because that hood will be in front of the windows and you will have glass immediately behind the flame. Um, you know, it's, it's not typical, but I do really like the look, I think. Okay. Um, so I, I think it look different. I mean, everything about the house is atypical, I think. <laughs> but, uh, but I think I do like this look better. Kitchens require compromise. <laughs> yes. So you're there. All right. Well, we've got a design showroom here behind us. Can we go look at what you're thinking about in terms of actual cabinets and countertops and that sort of stuff? Sure, yes, let's do that. 
Hi, Samantha. Hi, this is Kevin. Nice Kevin. to meet you, Samantha. So I love the showrooms and the vignettes. Very helpful for clients to sort of yeah. decide. Um, where did you guys get started in your process? Well, we first started on the flooring because that's the entire kitchen and yeah. living room area. And what, tile floor? This is large format porcelain tile. Wow, and are you thinking of tiles this large, Sunil? Yeah, maybe yeah. even larger, actually. In our kitchen and the living area, we're going to have uh, tiles that kind of uh, look like a concrete floor. We originally wanted a concrete floor, but that didn't work out in terms of the layout and the, and the space needed. So we're going to go with large format tiles. And porcelain, you said, was a material? Yes, this is all porcelain. Uh, of the three shades here, what are you leaning towards? Well, I think we're leaning most towards mm -hmm. the lighter gray. Okay. It's more concrete-like and goes along well with our mm -hmm. cabinet and other color choices. Beautiful. All right, so speaking of cabinets, um, have we made any decisions on style? Yep, we're going with this look. This is actually a handleless look, so you can see this is a horizontal channel that opens up the drawers yes. and the doors. Very nice, and so you can pull out some glass fronts. Oh, some of them even have lights tucked in there as well. I like it. Yep, and we're also doing a vertical channel on the refrigerator, which is nice so you don't have to have any handles on the refrigerator. You can just open it on the side with a this A really clean look right there, yes. right? Okay. Yep. So um, handleless channels, horizontal, vertical. This is, is that a glass front? Yep, this is a matte glass front and this is a high gloss lacquer. A high gloss lacquer. What are we thinking about in terms of finishes for the cabinets that we're gonna put in uh, Sunil's kitchen? Yep, we're gonna go with on the base cabinets, we're gonna do this lacquer in a matte finish. Okay, so this charcoal. is that charcoal color. This will be a nice grounding color and flat, right? Just really. Yeah, matte. Yep, yep. matte, okay. And, and then, this one? Yep, and for the talls by the window, so we have some reflection, we're going to go with a high gloss lacquer. So you're going to get the contrast not just in the color, but in the sort of matte versus high gloss as well. Like right. that? Yeah, no, I think it goes really well uh, with uh, the other surfaces that we have chosen for the uh, for the kitchen. And then the wood here, where does this go? Yep, this is a solid wood veneer, and we're going to do this as an accent for the shelves and oh. for also underneath the island. Beautiful. All right, so it sounds like that's a decision already made, right? Yeah, I think uh, I think that's pretty much final. Beautiful. And uh, what about countertops? A lot of choices when it comes to countertops. Yep, we're going to go either between a quartz material or a porcelain. All right, so quartz right here, porcelain right here. So, Sunil, have you decided between the uh, porcelain and the quartz and the matte and the gloss for the countertops? No, so unlike the cabinet doors, we kind of split evenly between the matte and the shiny finish. Uh, so, you know, it's to be determined. Okay. Well, I mean, you've got the showroom to help you and the uh, expertise to help you as well. So hopefully you'll walk away today with a decision on that for us. Yeah, and, you know, Charlie's pushing for it. He's moving fast, so we've got to decide soon. He is. Samantha, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Nice meeting you. Next time on This Old House. Once again, I will sing the classic plumber's lament. No room for ductwork. Back in 2001, we undertook one of our largest projects. This house right here, situated on the Atlantic Ocean. And 17 years later, we are back to see how it has held up. And Janet and David McHugh are still here. Nice to see both of you again. And an open floor plan means it's time to remove these old columns.